For 2,000 years, rivers were the only economically viable means of commercial transport in Europe. Hello and bienvenue to the Flavors of France. I'm Catherine Kinley. Burgundy's northernmost department, Yon, takes its name from the river, which has been its fortune since medieval times. Auxerre, its main town, once a busy river port, served as the gateway for the region's produce and became a busy marketplace for timber and particularly wine. In medieval times, Burgundy wine was in fact the wine of the Auxerre district. Auxerre has remained a gracious and active center and a popular destination for waterside retreats. Auxerre's history dates back to the Romans who used it as a garrison town on the important road from Lyon to Boulogne. The town has since lost its strategic importance, but it remains one of the most enchanting villages in all of Burgundy. One of the best views of the town is from the river. The flying buttress and tower of Auxerre Cathedral reflected in the deep flowing waters. The town center is superb with many attractive streets and narrow laneways. The famous Tour de l'Olage is actually part of the old medieval walls. The clock was added in the 17th century. One dial displays the time, the other the movements of the sun and moon. Auxerre's cathedral, dedicated to Saint Stephen, is a wonderful example of the Gothic style at its most flamboyant. Joan of Arc prayed here as she passed through the district in 1429. There are many little squares throughout the town where the Auxerrois love to gather. The local people have a lively spirit which is reflected in their love of food and wine and also their folk songs, many of which are known throughout France. There is also an infectious spirit of enterprise here, which is not surprising given that Auxerre was an active trading port for so long. The people here developed a taste for all kinds of delicacies, which come from all over France. A popular local recipe features oysters from Normandy, huitre à la gel d'eau de mer. The ingredients are oysters, watercress, shallots, parsley, cream, a sheet of gelatin, and pepper. First, the oysters are opened and the oyster flesh is removed. A few of the oysters are chopped and placed in a bowl with cream, shallots, and parsley. The mixture is well combined. A little seawater is poured into each oyster. While the gelatin is left to soften in cold water, the oyster water is collected in a bowl. When it has been heated just a little, the gelatin is added and combined. The remaining oysters are removed from their shells, set aside, and lightly fried. Oysters are very popular in France. Parisians prefer to enjoy them accompanied by a dry white wine like Chablis, produced here in Lyon. The oysters are well seasoned with pepper. The cream mixture is placed into each of the empty shells. The oysters are added. The shells are arranged on a plate. A watercress leaf is carefully placed in position on each. A little of the chilled aspic mixture is spooned into each oyster, filling the shell, and voila, huitre à la gel d'eau de mer. Bon appétit. 
a visit to Chablis, one of France's most outstanding white wine districts, and the production of Andouillette, king-sized sausages, the local specialty, when we return to the flavors of France. The little river of Serin runs through the charming village of Chablis, which has lent its name to a superb white wine of great renown. Chablis is probably the most imitated wine in the world. Connoisseurs insist that although good dry white wines have been produced in California, Australia, and New Zealand, none approaches the original Chablis produced here. A glass of Chablis is an ideal complement to Andouillette, a French sausage specialty. There are many varieties differing for the most part in the spices used in their preparation. The method known as a la ficelle involves laying out long lengths of tripe and filling them with a combination of minced tripe and herbs. One of the most exclusive gastronomic societies in France is devoted to the enjoyment of this tasty hors d'oeuvre. It meets regularly to discuss the relative merits of the andouillette from the various regions of France, including Lyon, and the best accompaniments. The minced tripe and herb mixture is added, taking care to cover the entire length. A mixture of other chitterlings is placed on top. then seasoned with pepper. The sausage is squeezed into shape. Placed on a large fork. and it is gradually worked over the pork intestine. Another variety of sausage is called andouille, where a larger intestine is used. To cook, the sausage is poached in boiling water the entire length of the sausage is placed in the pot. Which is covered to maintain the temperature. When cooked, the sausage is removed and placed on a rack to cool. Andouillettes are generally cut into slices and served cold. However, sometimes they're also grilled. At many of the Chablis district wineries, including international award winner Domaine Pinson, andouillettes are often served to prospective buyers in order to enhance the flavor and other qualities of wine they are sampling. The white wine known as Chablis is made from the Chardonnay grape grown adjacent to the town in the small northern pocket of the Burgundy wine belt. Vincent is one of the 13 producers of the Premier Cru Chablis, which is one of the most successful. The Burgundy region is renowned not only for its fine wine, but for its numerous award-winning chefs an exceptional chef, and an unusual recipe when we return to the flavors of France. Stay tuned. One of the chief delights of Lyon is the little village of Joigny, only a 20-minute drive from Auxerre. 
The town has had a tragic history, destroyed by fire in 1530 and damaged again by the German Luftwaffe during the Second World War. But many medieval and Renaissance era buildings remain. Joigny is home to one of the finest restaurants in France, La Côte Saint-Jacques. Chef Jean-Michel Laurent prepares one of his most popular dishes, Grebiche de tête et riz de veau. The ingredients are veal sweetbreads, bouquet garni, parsley, salt, cucumber, cooked veal's head, chicory, salad leaves, basil, flour, an egg, onion, carrots, celery, leeks, wine, vinegar, hazelnut oil, and veal stock. First, the carrot is chopped finely. Then the onion. the leek. Shallots, thyme and bay leaves are tied together for a bouquet garni. The herbs are trimmed and set aside. Little flour is added to the boiling water and combined. The chopped vegetables are added, then the veal head and a drop of vinegar as it cooks. The egg is hard boiled. The shell removed. And the egg is chopped finely. After three hours of cooking on a moderate heat, the veal head is removed laid out on a chopping board and cut into squares. It is set aside and the cucumber is finely sliced. Then the parsley and the chicory. The sweet breads are sliced carefully. Seasoned with pepper. And salt. Oil is added to a pan. The sweetbreads are sautéed lightly on both sides. A little butter is added. Some wine. the veal stock, which is allowed to reduce. A little hazelnut oil is added and combined. The sauce is then strained and allowed to heat again without boiling. It is seasoned with the chopped parsley, chicory, basil. The egg is added.
then it's all combined. Then the chopped veal head pieces. It's all well combined and seasoned with salt and pepper. The salad leaves are placed on a plate and the sweetbreads set on top. And a generous measure of sauce is poured over. And voila, gribiche de tête et riz de veau. Bon appétit. Vodka and whiskey have become fashionable as the basis for cooking sauces in recent years. However, when we return, we have a great new game recipe which uses Ma of Bourgogne, the outstanding distilled spirit of Burgundy. That's coming up next on the Flavors of France. Each year, in early November, the delights of Burgundian cuisine are shared with the world at the Dijon Gastronomic Fair. Each of the four departments are well represented, including Nyon. One of the most famous dishes dating back to the region of Louis XIV is a saddle of hair marinated in the fiery spirit of Burgundy, Marque de Bourgogne. Chef Jean-Michel Laurent has adapted this recipe known as Rable de Lièvre à la Piron. The ingredients are saddle of hair, celery, onion, carrot, sep mushrooms, game stock, cream, mock de bourgogne, juniper berries, grapes, red wine, and butter. Jean-Michel begins to prepare the marinade by chopping the onion, celery, and carrot finely. He places the vegetables into a dish and the saddle of hair on top. Juniper berries and red wine are added. The mushrooms are cleaned, trimmed, and then sliced. A few of the grapes are skinned and the pipes removed. After marinating for about four hours, the saddle of hair is removed and patted dry. Salt is added. And pepper. First, the meat is sauteed in a little butter. And then it's set aside with the pan juices. The cooking pan is then glazed and flambéed with mock de begogne. The sauce is strained and added to the pan. On a medium setting, it is allowed to reduce by half. The top of the sauce is skimmed regularly. Stock is added. Cream. And the ingredients combined. A little oil and butter is added to the pan. And the mushrooms sauteed. Seasoned with pepper. And the grapes are added. Flambéed again with mark. The sauce is strained combined with the mushrooms and grapes, and voila, rable de lièvre à la piron. Bon appétit. The ancient land of Burgundy is defined by over 2,000 years of history. The cultivation of the soil and the harnessing of nature have produced a unique civilization which has spread its influence throughout all of Europe.
Today, Burgundy is a thriving region with rich traditions and a lifestyle which is reflected in its excellent food and wines and the famed hospitality of its people. From the smallest hostel and family inns to the pleasures of grand cuisine, the taste of Burgundy is one to be savored and enjoyed time and again. Hello and bienvenue to the Flavors of France. I'm Catherine Kinley. One of the more attractive and interesting provincial capitals of France is Dijon. It is a busy commercial industrial town, the center of the Burgundy wine trade and the gastronomic capital of the region. It's gingerbread or pain d'épices, the black currant liqueur, cassis, and of course Dijon mustard are held in high regard. The city is popular among visitors not only because of these things, but also because it has preserved many buildings and monuments from the Ducal period. Dijon's importance dates back to 1364, when it became the capital of the Dukedom of Burgundy. Throughout the late medieval era, the city developed into the center of learning, art, and commerce in eastern France. The city's influence declined somewhat after Burgundy became part of the Kingdom of France at the end of the 15th century, but since the coming of the railways in the 1850s, Dijon has revived. A stroll along the ancient alleyways squeezed between the well-restored half-timbered houses quickly reveals the remarkable harmony which exists here between the old and the new. The bizarre forms of gargoyles representing lost souls and demons decorate the church of Notre Dame, built in the 13th century. The facade, a flat wall decorated with arcades, was a unique solution to the problem of a small site in this crowded quarter of the city. Towers and steeples dominate the skyline even today, from the church of Notre Dame to the old cathedral of Saint Banigneux. Its tower is over 300 feet high and was rebuilt in 1896, although the building itself dates back to the 13th century. The attractive semicircular Place de la Libération once enclosed the king's apartments. A great bronze statue of Louis XIV, which stood in the main square, was destroyed during the French Revolution and melted down. Beneath the tower of the Hotel Chambayon lies a magnificent interior courtyard and spiral staircase, an example of the Gothic style at its most flamboyant. The Duke's palace was rebuilt and enlarged toward the end of the 17th century. Only the tower of the old medieval building remains today. The palace is used as the town hall, and its splendid staterooms house the Musée de Beaux-Arts. The Rue de la Liberté is the city's main shopping thoroughfare. In Place François Rude is a Barouze, the statue of a vigneron or winemaker which serves as a reminder of the importance of winemaking to the prosperity of this region. Crayfish is widely available and a favorite recipe is fricasse de écrevis. The ingredients are red clawed crayfish, olive oil, tarragon, shallots, salt, pepper, crayfish stock, First, the shallot is peeled and then chopped finely. This recipe was created by three Michelin star chef Bernard Loiseau in his Côte d'Or restaurant. The tarragon is chopped next. This herb is very popular here and is often made into a cream or puree. Oil is heated in a pan and the crayfish added and sautéed. In Dijon, crayfish are very popular and the red clawed variety is the most popular. Pepper is added and salt. The crayfish are sautéed for two minutes then covered and cooked over a moderate heat for another couple of minutes.
The cover is removed. Butter is added and combined with the crayfish. A little shallot and the tarragon are added and combined. Then a little of the crayfish stock and it is all allowed to reduce over a medium heat. The crayfish are arranged on a serving dish and the juice poured over. Voila! Fricasse de Cravis from the Côte d'Or restaurant. Bon appétit! With a mustard making tradition that goes back to the 14th century, they take it very seriously in Dijon. Mustard making and an unusual recipe featuring Dijon mustard when we return to the flavors of France. The name Dijon is famous throughout the world as a quality mustard, which has been made here since Roman times. In those ancient days, mustard was an even more important condiment than it is today, since at that time there were few ways of keeping meat fresh. The grains were lightly crushed to become what is now known as moutade à la sienne. The smooth paste most often seen today first appeared in the 18th century. At the historic Mail processing plant, carefully selected mustard seeds are mixed with verjou, a subtle combination of local wine, salt, and water. The addition of spices, such as cinnamon and cloves, dates back to the medieval era. Despite the modern appearance of laboratory testing techniques, Mail still employs traditional methods of manufacturing. Since 1947, the secret of Mayles vinegar distillation and mustard recipe have been protected by French law. Much care is taken to maintain the highest standards. This product is endorsed by connoisseurs and gourmets throughout France and enjoys enormous prestige. The fame of mustard as a condiment spread throughout Europe in the 17th century due to the enthusiasm of the Sun King, Louis XIV. Mail became the official supplier of mustard to the courts of Austria and Hungary, and then, in 1771, to the Russian court of Catherine the Great. Today, the company manufactures 16 different varieties of mustard. In the Dijon showroom on Rue de la Liberté, there is a priceless collection of moutardiers, or mustard pots, dating back to the early 18th century. This is the company's shop, which has occupied the same location since 1777 and is still staffed by descendants of the original family. Dijon mustard is often used as the basis for fish sauces, such as effeville de saumon or la mousse de moutard. The ingredients are salmon fillets, fish aroma and vinaigrette, Dijon mustard, parsley, chives, Cheville, salt, butter, new potatoes, black pepper, egg whites. First, the salmon skin is removed from the flesh. Salmon spawn in the numerous freshwater rivers and streams throughout Burgundy. In France, salmon is popular in summer and winter and is often poached in a court bouillon made with vinegar, vegetables, and bouquet garni. It is served hot or cold with any number of sauces. The salmon skin is cut into small, thin slices. The potatoes are washed, dried, then peeled. Butter is added to a frying pan and the potato slivers are sautéed for about five minutes. In a separate pan, the salmon skin pieces are also sautéed in butter.
a little salt to taste. Then the salmon fillets are sauteed separately. A little salt. The egg whites are beaten until they stiffen. Fish aroma is then added to the Dijon mustard and it's combined. A little butter and the mixture is combined again. Vinaigrette is added. Combined. The egg whites are folded into the mixture and combined. Then the chopped herbs and parsley. The salmon fillets are set on the potato slivers and salmon skin pieces. A generous serving of sauce in the center, a sprinkle of herbs, and voila, effeville de saumon à la mousse de moutarde. Throughout France, there are various abbeys in which the monks produce wines and liqueurs, handicrafts, soaps, essence, and herbal mixtures, which are sold to the public. When we return, we're going to the 12th century abbey of Citeaux, where the monks produce a special gourmet-style cheese, which is almost all sold before it's produced. In the countryside near Dijon is the historic abbey of Citeaux. It was founded at the end of the 11th century when a group of Benedictine monks, uncomfortable with the worldly extravagance of their order, decided to pursue a more rigorous path. They organized their observance around work, foregoing the titles and revenue which usually supported monastic life at this time. Under the influence of Saint Bernard, who lived in the early 12th century, the Cistercian order flourished. The virtue of the work is still upheld at the monastery today. Citeaux produces what is widely regarded as the best cheese in Burgundy, rich in taste but easy on the palate. Production is already pre-sold weeks in advance. Community life in this area still revolves around farming. The district is well known for its cattle and its various kinds of poultry. A local recipe combines guinea fowl with pig's feet. Pintade farcie au pied de porc. The ingredients are pig's feet, guinea fowl, shallots, butter, parsley, olive oil, salt, pepper, and chicken livers. First, the pig's feet are placed into salted water and allowed to boil for a quarter of an hour. The shallots are chopped finely. Guinea fowl has been a part of European cuisine since Roman times. The flesh of the young bird is delicate and similar to that of pheasant. The pig's feet are removed from the water and left to cool. The parsley is chopped finely, then the liver. And the ingredients are combined. When the pig's feet have cooled, the meat is removed and placed in a bowl. The parsley, liver, and shallots are added, and all the ingredients combined. The mixture is then placed in the bird's cavity, and is then trussed with a thread. Oil and butter are added to a large casserole and combined.
Salt and pepper are added to the bird and then it's allowed to cook for 40 minutes in a moderate oven. And voila, pimental farci au pied de porc. Bon appétit. The Flemish influence and one of Burgundy's most unusual buildings, a dessert creation by a master chef, and a little up-tempo folklore, all when we return to the flavors of France. Stay tuned. About 20 miles from Dijon lies the town of Bonn, the original capital of Burgundy. Bonn's crowning glory is the Hotel Dieu, an extraordinary building which was built as a hospice for the poor. The most striking feature of this beautiful mansion is its magnificent roof, a remnant of the region's Flemish ancestry. Along the colorful streets of Dijon, restaurants of all kinds tempt the visitor. A highlight every year is the International Gastronomic Fair, when Dijonais relish the opportunity to share with visitors the delights of Burgundian cuisine. Dijon is not only known for its mustard, the local delicacies also include snails, sausages, poultry, and the superb hams of the Morvan. It is impossible to wander down these streets and not be reminded of the splendors of the past. The old dukes bestowed on Dijon a taste for life and the art of good living. This is a city proud of its past, yet always determined to embrace the present to build a solid future for its children. Of course, children of all ages love gingerbread, and Dijon boasts a favorite recipe, millefeuille pain d'épices. The ingredients are gingerbread and licorice sticks, egg yolks, milk, and sugar. The chef begins to make the creme anglaise by carefully separating the yolks. Then he combines them with sugar. The licorice sticks are broken up to enable the flavor to be released. Licorice shrubs are cultivated commercially in the Gard region of France. Milk is poured into a bowl. The licorice pieces are added and the milk is allowed to heat on a moderate setting. The bowl is removed and a little of the mixture is combined with half of the yolk and sugar. Once it is thoroughly combined, it is all poured back into the hot milk and again all the ingredients are combined. The mixture is passed through a sieve to eliminate the pulp of the licorice root. Only the creamy mixture is retained. Then the gingerbread is cut into thick slices. Sliced again. and cut into small pieces. They're added to the milk and brought to a boil. The gingerbread mixture is drained and then put through a mincer a little at a time. The other half of the yolk and sugar mixture is added and combined. Then it is all poured into another saucepan and combined again and allowed to set in the refrigerator. 
More gingerbread is sliced wafer thin, fried lightly, then sprinkled with icing sugar on both sides. The creme anglaise is placed on a serving plate. The gingerbread cream mixture is placed on a wafer. Another wafer is placed on top, sprinkled with icing sugar. And voila, millefeuille pain d'épices. Dijon's sweetest temptation. The growth of modern Dijon has inevitably led to many changes in the lives of the people here. Nevertheless, local traditions have been maintained and Dijon faces a prosperous future in full harmony with its past. Since Roman times, Lyon has always been considered to be a refined center of culture and learning. Today it still enjoys that reputation, but add to that its outstanding reputation in gastronomy. Hello and bienvenue to the Flavors of France, I'm Catherine Kinley. Not only is Lyon home base for several of the country's leading chefs, but it's also the location of l'école des arts culinaires, that literally means school of culinary arts. The school at Ecouli was established by the French Ministry of Culture as part of its program to promote France's cultural heritage, but more importantly, French cuisine. The president is France's number one culinary identity, Paul Bocuse. Other French hospitality industry leaders, such as Jean-Paul Lacombe, Alain Pic, and Pierre Troigros, are also involved. The school provides a wide range of industry training programs with particular emphasis on culinary arts. The school is deluged with applications from all over the world as a certificate from Ecouli creates the recipe for success. Lyon stands at the confluence of two rivers, the Rhone, France's second longest river, and the Saône. Set on the hill above the town is the Basilica of Fouvrière. The Lyon Town Hall is a fine example of 17th century architecture. And this ruined theater is the oldest in France. Lyon was founded by the Roman proconsul Lucius Munatius Plancus in 43 BC, who called it Lugdunum, after the Gaelic god Lug. The site of the Roman town is today under one of Lyon's many town squares, where the locals come for a stroll or to have a coffee and sit in the sun watching the passers-by. The Basilica of Fouvière has its origins in two sanctuaries that were built on a hill here in 1168. One was dedicated to the Virgin Mary, the other to English martyr St. Thomas of Becket. Over the years, wars and rebellions took their toll on the building, and in the 17th century, it barely survived attacks by the Calvinists. In the 19th century, a complete restoration was undertaken. Fabiche's Golden Virgin was added in 1852, and the building was completed in 1870. The Basilica is the symbol of Lyon's Catholicism, although some of the city's inhabitants have compared it to an elephant lying on its back. Another of Lyon's treasures is the 200-acre Parc de la Tête d'Or, or Park of the Golden Head. It was laid out in 1862 in the English style and comes complete with impressive entrance gates, statues, a lake, a large botanical garden, and greenhouses filled with exotic plants. The Rose Garden has 60,000 rose bushes representing 350 different varieties of rose. The park is the city's largest open space and is a favorite spot for fishing, rowing, riding, or just a stroll. Ten minutes from the center of Lyon is the University of Lyon Ecouli. It has been set up by the French government and run by the high priest of culinary art, Paul Bocuse. It's the seat of gastronomic learning home to the École des Arts Culinaires et de l'Hôtellerie, which deals with all aspects of the hospitality industry. Here, students gain expertise working beside the professionals and some of France's greatest chefs. The school is housed in a complex belonging to the community of Ecouli, set in a magnificent 17-acre park, and the 19th century chateau is home to Cesson, a restaurant better described as a gastronomic paradise open to the public, where students and staff alike practice what they teach. Everything here is delicious, and some dishes are quite unusual. 
like the stingray terrine that is about to be prepared here by Alain Lecossec. He uses white wine vinegar, fennel, red and green peppers, some rock salt, fresh baby spinach, a filet or two of stingray, garlic and fresh shallots with thyme and fresh bay leaves, white peppercorns. Then with a sharp knife, he trims and cleans the fillets of stingray. He places them in a saucepan containing the wine and vinegar. Then he prepares the peppers by removing the stalks, cutting them open and scraping out the seeds. He then peels them so that he's left with the soft flesh. He also prepares the fennel, chopping off the leaves and the base. A quick check on the fish to make sure it's cooked. Then it's back to the vegetables. The chef dices the red and green peppers, the fennel and the other vegetables. Then he adds them to the broth to cook on a high flame. He's already removed the fish and places it to drain. The spinach he cooks briefly in a separate saucepan. He skins the fish gently so that the flesh doesn't come apart. and then greases the rectangular mold. The mold is carefully lined with the spinach leaves, which are then covered with the fish, which is carefully layered. On the top of the fish go the diced and cooked vegetables spread out evenly. And on top of that, some freshly ground pepper and a pinch of rock salt. Then he spoons the gelatin over the top and starts again with the fish, following the same procedure until all the ingredients have been used up. Then it's covered with the last layer of spinach leaves. Chilled overnight and served sliced. Just outside Lyon at Ecoulis is L'Ecole des Arts Culinaires, France's School of Culinary Arts. Directed and staffed by France's top culinary authorities, it's more than just a cooking academy, rather a school of culinary stars of the future. That's next today on The Flavors of France. Saison, Ecoulis restaurant, is a student affair. The management of the restaurant is handled by Etienne Boissy, and Chef Alain Lecossec keeps an eye on the cooking. But the day-to-day -day running of the restaurant is handled by the students. As well as cooking, they arrange decorations, such as these magnificent ice sculptures. They also wait on tables, handle the finances, and generally take care of activities behind the scenes. This allows the school's students to get some solid practical experience in the hospitality business while still at school, and produces graduates who are fully trained in what they do. Teaching at Ecoli is done by experienced professionals still working in their chosen field, and this ensures that theory does not take precedence over practice. Ecoli has a wide range of programs aimed at all levels of students. The most demanding are courses such as the three-year program in management for the hotel and restaurant industry. 
It's designed to qualify its graduates for entry into the hospitality trade. Gourmet kitchen programs, whether they are for amateurs or professionals, are designed to present recent changes in the industry and keep the student up to date. The school's cookery courses are intensive and complete. Students are taught a whole range of skills, not just simmering and stirring. It is essential that any good cook know how to select the best ingredients, feeling for the texture and smelling, even tasting. Health and safety are important too, like how not to burn yourself when preparing a flambe. Ecoli also offers shorter courses, as well as the occasional special program. These include courses for the English-speaking gastronome who is interested in finding out just a little more about this important aspect of French culture. Classes consist of hands-on workshop instruction, practical demonstrations, and technical and theoretical sessions. If it all sounds like a lot, it is. Ecoli has a reputation to uphold as the finest culinary school in a country renowned for its cuisine. Without a doubt, this is where you'll find the Pierre Tralgro and Paul Bocuse of the next generation. One of the prime movers in L'Ecole des Arts Culinaires is its president, Paul Bocuse. Considered to be France's master chef for some years now, he still continues to play an active role as promoter and chef. He prepares one of his greatest specialties for us when we return on the Flavors of France. This restaurant in the little village of Colonge au Mont d'Or has been passed down from father to son since the 17th century. Today it's run by Paul Bocuse, chef of the century, who personally prepares a classic dish, coco vin. He starts with a chicken, of course, some spring onions and garlic, a piece of fresh bacon, fresh carrots, fresh mushrooms, some rock salt, white flour, and white sugar, a piece of butter, and a bottle of Georges de Boeuf Beaujolais. With a sharp knife, he removes the wings and legs from the chicken and then carefully cuts the fillets of white meat away from the bone. He seasons the meat with freshly ground black pepper and a pinch of rock salt. He melts a piece of butter in a saucepan and then adds the chicken pieces to fry gently. While the chicken is cooking, he slices the bacon. He then chops it into pieces an inch or so long. These are added to the pan with the chicken, and so too are the spring onions and chopped carrots. And a bouquet garni, a bundle of herbs. Then he turns the chicken over to fry the other side. He chops the mushrooms into quarters and adds them too. And then a splash of cognac for a flambe. He doesn't forget the most important ingredient, a good quantity of the Beaujolais to almost cover the chicken. And then he lets it simmer for half an hour. After about 10 minutes, he adds the chopped garlic. Stirring it in, he covers the pan. When it's cooked, he removes the chicken pieces and all the vegetables from the sauce, and then mixes the butter with the flour, mashing it together with a fork. He adds this mixture to the saucepan to help thicken the sauce. A taste just to check that all is well before adding all the ingredients to the thickened sauce for another couple of minutes. And voila, ready to be served to a lucky customer at Paul Bocuse's restaurant.
Decoration and presentation of food is a tremendously important part of the curriculum at Ecoli. Specialists teach the students ice sculpturing and sugar pulling. At times, the classrooms resemble an art studio on the left bank. Stay tuned for some magnificent colored sugar creations. The 19th century Chateau de Couli accommodates more than 130 students and, as you might imagine, has no shortage of kitchens. Presentation and decoration is fundamental to all culinary programs. Here's how the students are taught to make tuiles panier. The ingredients are almond flakes, powdered sugar, butter, one egg and a vanilla bean, fresh cream, and a basket of fruit, a banana, and some strawberries and apricots. The master chef begins by mixing the powdered sugar with the butter and the almonds, stirring thoroughly so that the ingredients are well mixed together. He then slices the vanilla bean lengthwise with a sharp knife and scrapes out the mixture of the pulp and seeds from the inside of the vanilla bean. He adds the vanilla to the almond mixture and stirs it well. Next comes the egg, just the white. The yolk won't be needed. This is also added to the bowl and stirred in well. The egg white should thoroughly moisten the mixture. The butter is melted and added, stirring all the time. It's particularly important that this dish is well mixed and the chef takes great care to stir in all the ingredients. The sugar should be dissolved in the egg white and butter and the almond flakes completely coated with the mixture. Tuile's panier should ideally be cooked on a flat oven tray. The chef greases the oven tray with butter and then spoons out the mixture onto the tray, one spoonful per portion. The back of the fork is the best thing to use to flatten down each serving. The tray is then placed in a hot oven and cooked for just a few minutes because the portions are so thin they'll cook quickly. When they come out of the oven, the pastries are carefully removed from the tray and placed upside down in the rows of a special curved cooling tray. As the almond shells cool, they'll harden into a curved shape. The cream is next. He pours it into a bowl and whips it until it's fairly stiff. Then he adds the powdered sugar. He stirs it into the cream until it's completely mixed and there are no lumps. The cream is spooned into the waiting almond shells. And a little more cream spooned onto the plate to support the shells. Finally, it's time for the fruit. The stalks are removed from the strawberries. The apricots are halved and stoned, and the banana is peeled. Meanwhile, the almond basket is waiting. The chef adds a chocolate handle. A few slices of strawberries, and a few more slices of apricot. and then the banana. 
He finishes the plate by decorating it with some of the remaining fruit. For the French, the visual appeal of the food is as important as how it tastes. This is just an example of the visual masterpieces that a good French chef can create. Sometimes the artistry exceeds the cuisine. Creations like this made from spun sugar often look too good to eat. At Ecoli, there are special classes devoted to working cooked sugar. Sugar has different characteristics at different temperatures. Students are first taught how to work with sucre fil, angel's hair, and then with sucre coule, powdered sugar. Once the students have a good understanding of its properties at different temperatures, they're taught to work with sucre tiré, pulled sugar, which is a form which can be kneaded, molded, and shaped like plasticine. It takes years of training and practice to be able to produce masterpieces like these. And looking at these magnificent sculptures, it's not always easy to decide whether this is beautiful food or edible art.